Ingram Smith, Buddy Elliott, back again for another episode of the Nolcast. As always, we will thank our title sponsor, Louisiana Hot Sauce, and the good people at Tarpon Cellars Wine. Uh, you can go to tarponcellars.com, uh, grab 20% off with use of the coupon code NOLCAST, and uh, we thank them for the support that they give us. So, Bud, this is our much-anticipated portal show, something that we've been looking forward to do, something we've been kicking around for about 10 days or so and have tried to have as many uh, conversations as we can to get a good of an idea as to where Florida State is with their own roster, what they think of it, and what their, uh, you know, kind of their list of priorities are in addressing that roster. Um, we're not like a real, <laughs> we're not like a real touchy feely podcast or anything like that, but tonight may be like particularly cold. You're, we're talking about a conversation here um, addressing the the harsh reality that is managing scholarships on a college football roster and uh, we're certainly not being critical of kids as individuals or anything else but we will hear a very honest assessment as to where we think Florida State is with their roster kind of what they think of their roster uh, after two years here and uh, hopefully it's a uh, a informative conversation uh, but it you know we're certainly not trying to take shots at kids or anything else just trying to give you an honest assessment of where they are what their numbers look like, and some of the steps that they may have to take towards addressing those numbers. It, it's a discussion I'm a little more willing to have now in the the immediate eligibility era of the transfer portal because now kids who want to leave don't have to sit out a year. They can go somewhere else and get playing time immediately. Uh, and playing time is something I wanted to lead off tonight's discussion with Ingram. Uh, FSU has quite a bit of playing time to sell both at the high school level and at the immediate you know, college transfer level. And from all accounts that I've heard, they intend to take the absolute max they can. Uh, but there's a couple things there, right? The max is 25 normally, but if you add the seven on with this year, with the transfer exemption, maybe you can take 32. Uh, we'll see about that. But also you have to fit that within the 85. Uh, and the 85, there is no leeway on. And that is, um, that's something that they're going to have to be willing to do if they want to get this roster flipped in time. We know that Mike Norvell, well, Mike Norvell has not told me this. Common sense tells me this. It's not going to be a great team next year. It has a chance, if they get everything right, it has a chance, a chance to be a good team in 2023. If you're going to get there, you probably need to be able to put a passable product on the field, like, you know, bowl game, seven, eight wins type type product in 2022. And in order to do that, you're going to have to admit internally that you had a lot of misses in the 2020 class, which, again, so did Jimbo in his transition class. So did Dan Mullen, even though he had a, you know, a couple of really nice years to start. We saw it kind of bite him in the butt this year. Uh, so did Willie. So did basically every transition class that I have tracked. Scott Frost at Nebraska, his transition class was a disaster. It is just a result, I believe, of the short season portal class. Every podcast is somebody's first. If you're a longtime listener of the Nolcast, you have certainly heard me say this. I talk about this almost every episode because it, it's an issue that continues to plague this program. But you had a whole lot of misses in that first class. And you're no different than a lot of other programs. If you want to get maximum space, you got to, you got to get those kids up out of this roster. And it's easier to get rid of Willie's kids yeah. or the couple of Jimbo stragglers than it is to get, you know, get rid of kids that you sign for a variety of reasons because you have to admit that you made mistakes. And every staff deals with this. And to some extent with the 2021 class, although I've been fairly encouraged by some of the returns there, you know, I think there's some guys who are obvious misses already out of that class after just two semesters on campus, or in some case, one semester. But that's not really surprising because how many of these kids were they really able to ever meet in person? A couple at junior days. And how many how many of them were they ever able to work out in person? Like zero because of the COVID shutdown. Uh, so, and it's not like they had prior camps with these guys in previous years because they just got here. They're going to have to make some tough calls, man. They're, they're going to have to really... Uh, they're going to have to lean on some of these kids with the exit interview process. 
It's going to be very interesting, and and you certainly made a, a point that I was going to that it is it is very different to look a kid that you recruited in the eye, deal with uh, you know whatever team is surrounding him, be it his parents, being you know an uncle, uh, high school coach. It's uh, it's a different situation when you when you have to look at a kid, particularly a kid that you might have signed as recently as a year ago, and just tell him. We made a mistake. Like you said, we made a mistake, and, and unfortunately, after uh, 365 days, we have to have a legitimate conversation with you that we're concerned that you're not for state quality, uh, you know, at, the, at least where we want to take this roster. So uh, we'll try to give you an idea of position by position, as we're uh, fond to do historically in this podcast, as to where they are um, and what that looks like as far as the process of getting down to a number uh, that pairs with your desire to if you don't max out, good. I mean, you're probably going to bring in somewhere between 30 new players into this program, uh, and you've got to figure out how to do that. So, uh, we'll take our uh, take our first crack at it with a quarterback position, bud. So, real quickly, departures. Milton's graduating. Uh, Rodemaker does not look like a Florida State quarterback to me so far. Uh, obviously, there's uh, a nice little athlete there that. Maybe you can shape over time, but Tate Rodemaker wouldn't be the first person who decides he doesn't necessarily want to leave Tallahassee, you know? I mean, it's pretty pretty cool being Florida State's backup quarterback and having, uh, you know, the t- high school town that you grew up in, what, 65 minutes away or whatever it is, Valdosta. That may be a kid that you have to uh, have a conversation with, but a kid who may look you right back in the eye and go, yeah, coach, I understand I may not play that much, but... I'm close to home. Uh, You walk around the same campus I do. It's pretty great. I'm not sure I want to leave. That's exactly right. So if if they tell him, I don't know they're going to tell him this. It's just our opinion and an informed opinion, I believe, based on who we talk to. But if you tell him, hey, man, you're never going to play here, right? At the Power 5 level, you have guaranteed scholarships. So it is harder to just out and out cut kids now. You really got to lean on them and say, you're not going to play here. Um, I don't think that like he's the type of kid that they're going to go and, and make his life hell for, obviously. like You, you want to maintain good relationships with, with, with high schools, and, and you don't want to be total jerks about the process. Uh, but what, what happens if a kid has the self-awareness to realize he ain't going to play, and he's not going to go pro, and – you, you almost have to hope that somebody loves football enough that they can transfer somewhere else, right? Because it's not like at the quarterback position you're getting hit a lot. I mean, you do have to work out, and um, there's a, a big time commitment. But anyway, like that that is a potential spot if, if something happened there. Uh, I put Milton in here just because I think some people ask, can he come back? Uh, I, I think one year is probably enough on that. So awesome story that he was able to uh, overcome the injury to even get back on the field, but – uh, not not going to be playing for FSU next year. On the incoming side, A.J. Duffy, who you know, I think is a, a solid quarterback prospect. Still, though, Jordan has not shown an ability to stay healthy, like to play enough games, and misses an absolute ton of practice time with various ailments. I think you need to be delicate about how you do this, but I do think FSU uh, – I'm not guaranteeing you they're going to bring in somebody in the portal, but I think they should at least consider it. I, f- I fully expect them to bring somebody in. Uh, I mean, you got to be got to be delicate with it, both with the guy that you have on the roster, who you believe has made you know steps forward, and who you believe can be a quarterback for you. Uh, you also don't want to run off your first legitimate high school quarterback commitment in quite some time, uh, but you need to find someone who can be a bridge and, and you use the term you chose your words carefully there as you're fond of doing when describing uh jordan and and there are just some some issues with him being able to to stay healthy uh and and, and be able to participate consistently whether it be in a, a practice or a game setting so um i expect them to bring somebody in here it's going to be very interesting to watch them thread the needle of trying to find somebody that they think can contribute if necessary uh, that is going to be accepting of the fact that Jordan Jordan Travis is QB1 for the foreseeable future. You'll have to go in and play pretty well to to take him out. And also, 
you know, you've got to have a little bit of a uh, age, I guess, guidance, not restriction, but guidance with uh, what you're doing. And I don't let me put it this way. I don't think you're going to bring in a redshirt freshman as a as a quarterback transfer and and then start to, you know, sow see seeds of concern that the first legitimate high school quarterback you've gotten around here in three or four years is going to jump in the portal because he doesn't see a pathway for him to get in any kind of legitimate playing time either. 100%. So the ideal candidate here is somebody who you think might be starter quality, but who is not going to all of a sudden become a terrible teammate if he ends up being the backup. That's not going to be easy to find. You might have to sacrifice on one of those two elements. Teammate quality, or talent. Spencer Rattler fit that bill? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't really think so, personally. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I think he's going to go somewhere where he's pretty much guaranteed the starting job. I, I've not been a Rattler guy for, uh, well, tw- since 2018 at least. So that's, you know, four football seasons ago. Just All right. little jokes. All right, we'll move to the running so back position. So probably, probably a QB. I think you should. It's prudent. It's the most important position on the field. You can wait a little bit if you want to. You don't have to necessarily take one right now. It's not the craziest thing to, to you know think, let's get Duffy on campus and, and, and just see see how college ready he is and then use that information to shape your, your, your strategy there. Moving to running backs, you do have a running back who is draft eligible and has already sustained a decent or a significant injury uh, in his own right. And Corbin had a really nice bounce back year. I don't think he's made a decision, but I've mentioned for a month or so that it wouldn't shock me if he doesn't ultimately decide to go. And I wouldn't blame him or really any running back that, that makes that decision. That'll be something that we monitor and watch play out. And then when you kind of look at other names, um, is Corey Wren necessarily somebody that's going to be here? Uh, you know, obviously Douglas has gotten enough burn that you think he's part of your your uh, your your plans moving forward. Every other name as far as Tofili and uh, and obviously uh, kind of the breakout year that you had number eight. He's not going anywhere, but um, it's an interesting running back room. And and you brought in one guy on transfer that you got some playing time for, but it's obviously going to uh, you know, be more in your plans moving forward. I think you either hit a home run here in the in the portal or otherwise you don't really touch it. I, I agree. Um, Rodney Hill's coming in. I, I don't really have a feel for what Corbin's going to do. I, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, he is certainly draft eligible. The other one that like we discussed on the last pod is is Javante Barnes, the, the, the high school back. You know, if, if you get him, I definitely don't think you take you take a transfer back. I think you probably sit tight here in the transfer portal, unless for some reason you just get an absolute home run. I mean, if you're able to get like a Jameer Gibbs, um, I, if for some reason you have reason to believe that you can keep Zach Evans in check, then maybe I'd be more willing to take a, a chance on kind of a a wild card personality, should you say? at the running back position that, that I am at the receiver or excuse me, at the quarterback position, just due to the, like the leadership nature of those spots. But I, I think I, I agree with you there. Probably, probably nothing on the running back transfer side. Um, so we're probably looking at what one spot created so far b- between QB and, and running back, maybe two. Yeah, I, mean, I think you'll have I think you'll have either somebody declare for the draft or leave at running back. I, I think you'll have a spot open up there. So I think that's uh, fair. That's that's where I am through two position previous, anyways. Wide receiver uh, gets a little interesting here. Nice story, nice locker room guy, a nice bounce back from a really low moment in the ULM game. But Keyshawn Helton, somebody that I think you need to look at here as to whether or not he's. Uh, Absolutely in your plans. Jordan Young has continued to emerge. I personally liked what I saw of him uh, at the end of the year, but still a guy that's been around for quite a while and doesn't have a a ton of production tied to his name. Uh, Is a hell of an athlete, but still quite the project. Um, 
Portier, I think, is a is a name to watch here as well. Again, a guy that got a decent amount of playing time last year, kind of a little bit of hit and miss this year. Um, but some of these names, you know, you're going to see some guys have to leave to make some of the room that we're talking about. And uh, I certainly think that at least one of the names that we mentioned is probably going to have to uh, make it, you know, try to go make it elsewhere, uh, if not two. I agree with you. A um, whole lot of guys on this list that I don't think are really – are somewhere between can't play and can't make a difference for you. And you're going to need to free up some spots. Uh, as far as who do you bring in, well, you got Mortimer coming in. FSU thinks he's the best slot in the state, and they, they like him a whole lot. Also, I think there's a solid chance he is your, your return guy. Uh, he did set the all-time – return record for the county down there. So that that's 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 no small shakes. Um granted being a good high school returner, not a guarantee you'll be a good college returner, but I think it, it's it's encouraging nonetheless, right? They're still very much in it with Kevin Coleman. Uh we will see if they're able to land him. I think they go in house at the end of next week, which would put it somewhere around what is that, like the eighth or the ninth? Um we will almost certainly know if Mario Cristobal is staying or going from Oregon at that point in time, uh, which could have an impact on this recruitment. Obviously, if, if Oregon's head coach bounces, then you know we'll we'll see. He hasn't come out and said that he's staying or that he's going. Obviously, he's got a conference championship game to play uh, on Friday, and Miami has not come out and announced Manny Diaz or anything yet, despite the fact that a fake account is uh, uh, did a pretty good Miami fake. And did the whole like like the welcome Manny Diaz back for next year thing? It almost got me, but the uh, the, the the fake verification badge there, you know. Um, I don't really think they're going to dip down high school wise past Kevin Coleman. I think what I would expect here at this spot is Coleman plus a transfer or two transfers. And I think you do need to be able to find a way to get attrition of two out of this room. Like you need, you need to get two of these dudes up out of here. Yeah. If you want to open up the spots to really flip this roster. Not to be redundant, but I'm right there with you. I, I think you see some decent turnover here. I think uh, what you said about you get two bodies. It's either Coleman and a, and a, and a transfer kid, or it's two transfer kids that you – do your best to go out there, convince that, uh, you know, they're going to put up more production than, than previous units and that it's an offense that is evolving and will feature and focus on a wide receiver more than it has up until this time. Uh, I'm real curious about what you can do out in the transfer portal here. And uh, hopefully Florida State is judicious in the process and uh, and tries to get as good of a prospect as possible at the same time you got to realize with the, the kind of the cards you're playing and what are you talking about? A wide receiver core who had the, your leader had 20 catches this year, uh, yeah. 21 catches over the course of a season. I mean, that's, it's not the only thing a poor whole kid's going to look at, but it's, that's going to matter. Well, no, no. I mean, he's also going to look at quarterback, right? And, you know, uh, Travis has a reputation as a runner and his stats also say that he's a runner not really a thrower. I think he's improving as a thrower, but they're going to have to to pull some magic here. It's probably playing time and lean on what you did at Memphis as as, as the sell there. Right? One thing that's an easy sell is the dynamic duo of Chad and Shannon, and uh, they don't stop working for our listeners. Uh, neither do they stop being interested in what's going on with Florida State football, as is evidenced by our text thread here as we record uh, this episode. So those guys are fully invested in what's going on in the recruiting trail right now, or at least fully uh, fully invested in trying to figure out uh, what's going on. And uh, they are, uh, you know, fans of the recruiting process and, and experts of uh, putting you in a fantastic home and with as good of a mortgage process as possible as my co-host has gone through twice and can personally attest to it's a dynamic duo fantastic team and people that we are ever so fortunate to be able to work with dude no doubt about it best duo in the business call shannon and chad 844 fsu loan 844 fsu loan 
price, quality, service, expert knowledge of the market. Great null banter. Like they're literally texting us during the pod, and uh, they don't know that we're, we're doing it because we're not going live tonight, just in case you know we need to edit something of this out. But uh, yeah, uh, currently Chad is noting the lack of production from some of the higher rated players on the roster, and I agree. And I just said they need to cut about twenty guys off this roster. So we're actively discussing this, and yeah. they'll be listening to it in a couple hours, I would think. Um, so, uh, tight end? Tight ends, man. This will be an interesting one. Okay. Possible departures. Cam McDonald could go pro. I mean, I don't think he's a pro player. Do you? Uh, no, I don't necessarily think he is a, a pro player. Uh, you know, look, I don't blame anybody for trying it. And if they think that they've got a little bit of tape and are, you know, going to be able to impress at pro days. I started to say the camp, uh, the combine, but McDonald's not, you know, M- McDonald will be a part of a private combine, uh, not necessarily the one that takes place in Indiana, but if they think they're going to test well and uh, they think that that's what they want out of their next step in life, man, good for you. I- I'm happy that Florida State yeah. was a, a vehicle to, uh, to get you in a place where you feel confident testing those waters. And if that's what McDonald does, he certainly, certainly goes with my blessing. I wouldn't, I don't blame anybody for, for trying that, uh, despite the fact that maybe they don't have the, you know, the tape that you would think is indicative of somebody declaring early. 100% agree with you on that. Um, good kid, did a lot of stuff for charity at FSU. As far as I know, not a problem guy. So, uh, I don't think he's an NFL player, but we'll see. Other room you can clear up in this room. Uh, the staff likes Douglas. I will tell you that. Marcus and Douglas. But they'll tell you that, but they didn't play him in games this year. Right? And your tight end room isn't good. It's one of the worst positions on the team. So there's some kind of disconnect there. Either he's still learning the position too much. You know? Certainly possible. But if he could play, don't you think they would have played him this year? Maybe I'm wrong. You certainly had some guys emerge at the end of the year, but the the tight end position is, you know, we we have talked about the talent in that room and the desperate need to develop it, and I think that's a, a good point. Uh, I know your guy ID'd one of these dudes as a miss, which is yeah, kind of I a mean, COVID class casualty, right? Look, Carter Boatwright's somewhat in a similar situation as far as Rotomaker. He's, you know, I don't local. I don't know if you want to call Moultrie local, but it's certainly not long distance. I mean, you can, you know, be back and forth to, to college in what 85, 90 minutes or whatever it is there, and uh, that's a. Is is just Boatwright somebody that he thinks is going to go play somewhere else? I don't know. Uh, again, being a backup tight end at Florida State ain't that bad of a life, and if. Uh, football isn't necessarily what he sees himself doing, then, again, one of these exit interviews where you look in the eye and you tell him he's not going to play a whole lot of football in the future for you isn't necessarily the, um, you know, the catalyst for him leaving, like it might be for other kids. Uh, so you'll just have to see. Kobe Gross, uh, in my opinion, that might, you know, that's probably not a hit either, but we'll just have to see what happens uh, with that one. I think that's... Uh, a situation that where you see him probably cycle off your roster within a year or so, uh, one way or another. Yeah, so he came in as a JUCO, right? So they can graduate him after next year? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my understanding, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the question there is probably this year or next. As far as, yeah. Um, you got a lot of scholarship guys here. A lot of guys can't play. That's kind of an issue. You you need to free up some room if you're going to fix this room. You do have two kids coming in, in Drell Powers and Brian Courtney. Uh, You're done at the high school ranks this year unless unless Max Johnson's brother wants to come, which we'll see what Brian Kelly feels about that. Of course, Kelly at Notre Dame does have a really good reputation for developing tight ends. So that dream is probably dead, I would would think. one transfer here, 
you feel like? Yeah, yeah. If you can get the turnover that we talked about, I, I don't know that you can take another. You, oh, you're signing two high school kids. If you it have tells you about kids. this room, doesn't it? That they yeah. that they still want to take a transfer tight end, oh, and they have like six or seven on, on, on the roster. It's very indicative. One of those guys has to transfer. McDonald has to go pro. If you're bringing in another guy outside of high school, that that's the, my my ten second recap on the tight end position. I agree with you there. Uh, offensive line. This is an area that I'm very confident you will clear up some room. I, I know you are as well. Yeah. Again, not being critical of individual kids, but last names of Goss, Henry, maybe Herring. If Herring, Herring may be one of those guys that wants to go play ball somewhere else. Not Is, like, is he in that boat right uh, Rodemaker yeah, part for you there? He fits – some of the some of the similar characteristics in the fact that he's fairly close to fairly close to home but i think he may have a larger desire to play ball uh than yeah than the other two and I, more I think, upside i think too i think herring I, wants to play college football somewhere and, and maybe that's florida state and maybe it develops maybe it's not uh but ira henry goss i would more or less bank on those kids probably going somewhere else and wouldn't shock me to see Herring be a third. I, I think that's that's fair. Uh, you got a We've whole bunch of high school the kids, high school kids at length. I don't, you know, we don't yeah. need to go over that. If you listen to this podcast, you're pretty familiar that they're bringing in a whole lot of high school kids and and maybe one more uh, of a of the legacy variety. Um, you're also bringing in one transfer who who is already committed. Uh, I think that they are going to take. At least two and maybe three transfers mm -hmm. on the offensive line. So that's one to two more guys. You probably need to get somebody to play center in case Marie Smith is not able to to, to add enough strength this offseason to, to not get blown off the ball. And you really need to find, I think, somebody who can play tackle. Uh, I asked over there, and I was told, like, they're not down on Willis and Orr. But they think that the odds are that those are more 2023 contributors, not 22s. Which is encouraging that they think they're contributors, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, they're not saying, hey, these guys are misses. And we knew that, that Willis was certainly a long-term project. Uh, I was a little more hopeful on Orr. That, you know, and granted, like we got a whole offseason and a whole spring and a whole summer to go through. So that could be wrong. Or who knows? Maybe, maybe Orr is starting for you this fall because he's – become a freak hit the weight room hard you know, really got it but it's not crazy to think a guy needs a couple years before he's, he's a real real contributor in the offensive line that's what happens at most schools at fsu recently the pattern has you know been having to play these guys too early because you have no depth the, the portal i think is allowing you to bring some of these guys along at their own pace i don't think schrader's going to go anywhere do you but obviously the injury is a pretty big deal like as far as delaying his likely contribution yeah <clears throat> yes um schrader to me physically looks like he's got some some work to do and uh you know maybe this summer he gets back fully cleared get back in the weight room but when i see that kid i don't see a guy that's seven months eight months away from playing <laughs> you know meaningful snaps at at uh, the level that florida state offensive linemen or at least where this fan base wants Florida State offensive linemen uh, to be, just from a physical standpoint. Now, look, there's been guys that are undersized uh, relative to other linemen that have done well, but uh, to me, looks like there's some development that needs to be done in, in injury, which uh, to some extent has hindered that physical development. Um, it, so you mentioned they've already got the one kid committed. I know that there's a, a prospect that they're looking at from, from Love Taylor's former school right now. I don't know, uh, where they are in the process of that, but that looks like that's something that could be, that could kind of play itself out in the next 10 days or so. So from this offensive line, as far as their portal activity, we can have a pretty good idea as to what they're doing by, uh, you know, by, uh, by the early signing period, um, uh, I was told to the high school kids that they're bringing in because of how many guys they expect to lose at this position. They want to get at least two transfer offensive linemen in for spring. I mean, at, at some, at some base level, it's, we need to be able to have enough bodies to run practice. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just a functional thing. Not even thinking about the field 
come the fall. Uh, you can make a real argument they were too picky last year in the transfer portal. Uh, you know, the the Johnson kid who went to Texas A&M from Tennessee, he, he struggled for A&M. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't, wouldn't have been a starter here. So uh, I think they'll be a little bit a little quicker on the, the trigger this year at this position. Other positions, they, they might wait a little bit more. As we transition to defense, bud, this is this is the uh, <laughs> this is the unit that I'm really interested to talk to you about because this could play out in all sorts of different ways, and, and that is the defensive line that I'm talking about. As far as the departures go, I think True Thompson probably goes elsewhere. Uh, yeah. Good kid, works hard, probably not a Florida State defensive lineman. Um, let me see. I'm, I'm being careful of how I word this, but <laughs> I know what you're going to say because you told me the real quote before. Would it shock me if one of these one of these prospects on the defensive line either, you know, make a decision that's shocking uh, as far as entering the draft or uh, or entering the portal? Wouldn't blow my wouldn't blow me away if you if you hear something like that. I mean, there's there's been some some uh, some fairly humorous conversation about. Uh, some of the decisions that some of these guys might be also. So wouldn't shock me if you don't see a curveball in the portal, as far as the end position to Thompson, I think is gone. And then the real interesting part of the conversation here, bud is love it. Who about a month ago, I was fairly sure was going to go pro and Cooper. You could go zero for two. You could go two for two. As far as these kids deciding to come back or these kids deciding to go pro. Uh, I don't know that. Well, I'm fairly confident that a decision uh, by either of those two has not been made. And uh, like I said, you could you could flip a coin here and get both of these guys back, or you could get the wrong end of that coin and uh, really desperately looking to fill the interior in a manner that really you can only do in the portal. Uh, I, I would agree with you on that. Um did hear that, that Jermaine Johnson has you know been singing the praises of, of returning to school and, and really getting your draft stock up. So, Got it. That ain't the kid that keep the, the, the gift that keeps on giving. Say, is, is that is Jermaine a, an actual player, or is this just some kind of AI bot that we have hacked somehow, uh, both on the field in the locker room and now in, instructing teammates as to uh, you know what could go right or could go wrong about declaring for the draft a year early. One hundred percent. So this is the one spot where they still have work to do, like with multiple kids at the high school level. Uh, you have obviously Marvin Jones Jr., Nigel Lake Kelly, who I do know that Mike Norvell has a major personal hand in that recruitment. That's sort of like one of the guys that he's designated that he's responsible for. Uh, and Tyree West, the uh, the Georgia uh, former Georgia uh, commitment, who did take a trip to Auburn. Obviously, a lot a lot of balls in the air right now at Auburn. We'll, we'll see. I I don't think Harson's going anywhere now that Washington is filled, but. I also don't know. I mean, FSU could be portal shopping at Auburn next offseason. That would not shock me at all if you catch my drift. So they still have Jones. They still have Kelly. They still have Tyree West. I think you probably need to go after like two to three D linemen, depending on, on the development of guys like Wilson, who again, COVID class, came in at under 200 pounds, mm-hmm. right? A guy you never got a chance to work out in person because of, of COVID. Can, can you get one of, of Wilson, Peyton, or Turner to be a contributor for you next year? And then another one of those guys be a contributor for you the year after? Can, can you go two for three as far as hitting on those dudes? That would really help this program a whole lot. I mean, three of three, sure, do a backflip, but I'm just trying to be realistic here. You still need to go out and get, I think in an ideal world, if you can get enough guys off your roster, two ends and, and, and a tackle. But this also depends on how you do it at the high school level. Like if you get Jones and Kelly, those guys are going to play immediately for you. Right, right. And you don't need to take that many transfers if you get those guys. If, it, there is a relationship there. Yeah, if you get Jones and Kelly, one, congratulations. Two, yeah. 
Nigel Lee Kelly is not uh, like the best prospect that you've signed, but that's the best example of Florida State doing work uh, in recruiting that we've seen in a long time as far as both. I, and I've said this before and so have you as far as identifying the kid before anybody else. Yay blew up, decommitted, wanted to look at all the other suitors that he had. And if you're able to ride through that and sign this kid ultimately, hats off to the staff and everybody else associated in that effort because that's a, a hell of a hell of a recruiting effort. So, um, yeah, I think you're two. I think you're two for one in here. And it depends on the high school kids if you go for two for two with Kelly, or it depends on the interior guys if you go 0 for two as far as the retention of the two kids that we talked about that are debating the draft. So I think uh, you take three here and you either go two outside or two inside depending on uh, both incoming and outcoming or outgoing decisions being made. All right, now for a position where you might want to charter a bus uh, to, to, to ha- <laughs> handle some of the – Okay, so linebacker. Do you think you might you need some congruity HR solutions to, to handle all this potential movement here? I would uh, I would love Matt Lewis to come in here, and maybe I'd even love Matt Lewis to find some of these guys work uh, elsewhere um, if that's their, their ultimate wish. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that, like, in not in theory, but in actuality, we're still talking about Warner – I hard again hard for me to believe that um rice I'd, I'd love for him at rice to be a contributor here and, and give you something at the linebacker position uh that you haven't had in a while but if you don't think he's gonna be that then he doesn't do you a whole lot of good being on your roster again and, and again right. this is uh somewhat of a cold conversation it's not one that I enjoy but you have to manage this roster and some of that is making a decision on a kid as to whether or not he can occupy a spot on that roster. Um, Gainer, good athlete, going to test well. Wouldn't shock me to see him declare. Uh, I know that, again, it's not necessarily a, a guy that has tons of tape that's reflective of uh, of somebody doing that, but I could see Gainer going pro. As, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see time play out it's hard to say this but you don't have maybe the best of internal reviews on some of the kids some of the most recent signees at this position either uh i think they probably would have liked to see jordan eubanks develop more in the time that they've had him and i'm not sure that's happened so a lot of a lot of misses here and a lot of kids that uh you know maybe you thought were going to be players and and never turned into them what do you do with dicks i mean kid looks like zeus can't really play football. Not really somebody you can have on your roster if you've made the decision that he's not a linebacker at Florida State, which, you know, uh, playing time would tell you that perhaps you've made that decision. Like you said, this may not be a car. This may be a, uh, a rather large SUV when it comes to some of the turnover that you see at this position group. I mean, if they're serious about flipping this roster, you need to have probably four. Of the group you just you just read off, yeah, yeah, which to me says you probably need to find a way to t- take another transfer as well. Um, I know Craig some people is another guy that seems like he's been on the roster for five or six years. Uh, that's a guy that doesn't play; he's on scout team. Um, not only McCray but uh, McCluster. Yeah, yeah, it's just I, a yeah whole lot of spots here that uh, you're gonna have to see turnover. So. Uh, didn't probably do Matt Lewis justice <laughs> in you, the ad read there. Uh, did you mention, so we'll uh, back real did you mention quickly. Eubanks? I'm sorry. Did you mention Eubanks? I did mention Eubanks. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I did. Uh, you can, you can visit our friends at Congruity HR, Matt Lewis, a uh, fantastic partner for us. If you want me to, uh, introduce you to him in a, uh, less formal situation, feel free to reach out to us, whether it be email me on Twitter. Uh, but Matt's a, a fantastic Noel uh, would be a great addition to your business as he as he has been for ours. And uh, please do reach out either to me or him directly uh, if you have an interest in partnering with him. Totally agree. Uh, those guys are awesome. As far as the needs here at linebacker, you already have Omar Graham coming in. Uh, the Saint will decide on Saturday. Interesting timing there because I don't know if on Saturday – 
Well, you might know by Saturday if, if Cristobal is coming or not to Miami because Oregon plays their conference title game on Friday, but it is an interesting date uh, to make that call on. Uh, obviously, if Cristobal goes to Miami, I wonder if that's not a uh, not a recruitment that will uh, continue. You know, so I I do think you need to go ahead and take one transfer there at the linebacker position. You want to go DB? <clears throat> Uh, I do want to go DB. It wouldn't shock me to see two at linebacker. That would be my comment okay. about that. I know that's numbers heavy, and you got to make it work one way or another. But um, if you don't get two at the high school ranks, which hopefully you do, hopefully you close the recruitment of a saint, um, I, I could see you going as many as two here. So, yeah, let's do talk at DB, and we won't be um, you know lacking potential turnover here either. Um <clears throat> Travis Jay was probably the guy that I was most excited about individually on the roster coming into this year. I made a really bad evaluation there. A uh, lot of physical talent, obviously, just didn't transition over. Uh, I don't know that it would break this staff's heart if you hear that Travis Jay is transferring out or entering the pro the portal. There's some talk about maybe him going to offense. That's not just, in my opinion, silly message board rumor. Maybe you see that happen. In my opinion, if Travis Jay's on this roster and contributing, there's a much higher percentage that it's on the offensive side of the ball than it is on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I think if Travis Jay wants to play defense, that he may go do so elsewhere. And the kid's got all the talent in the world. He won't lack suitors if that's his decision. I, I would agree with that. Everybody's going to be willing to take a chance on the you know athletic potential there. Um Brendan Gant is another guy who, you know, does he look elsewhere for playing time? He's he's not getting playing time now, except when somebody gets hurt. He's an upperclassman. Bernardo Green, kind of the same thing. Uh, I think it's probably better than 50-50 that, that, that you know, he, he would consider transferring. Uh, Jamie Robinson will have a factor in this. Uh, he tweeted out kind of a vague tweet. It was not a I'm going pro tweet but it was also not an I'm coming back tweet. He is going to what in his fourth or fifth year of college football. So he's very much draft eligible. Did make first team all ACC. So congrats to him. Uh, eight players made the all ACC team. Seven were transfers. A little bit crazy that Gibbons and Love Taylor are on the same team, given that Love Taylor was almost unplayable this year for you because, because of health. I mean, he was really good last year to, to be fair. Like, it's not his fault. He, the, the guy got hurt, and he just didn't bounce back to that level. Gibbons, when he was healthy, was actually decent. So Gibbons is a very good player for you. He played, yeah. performed significantly better than I expected. And just internally, that was not a, hey, this is a sure thing from day one. I mean, there were a lot of questions as to, hey, did, did we get this right? Uh, is this going to work out? You took uh, two backups from Georgia and Notre Dame, and they were – our, Jermaine, inarguably, Gibbons, there's an argument he was your be- he was one of your best players on offense. Yeah, I think that's I, – I would have no problem saying Gibbons were your two or three best offensive players this year. I mean, he gave you great effort, put himself through a significant amount uh, to get ready in each game and uh, performed at a level that I would not have been able to anticipate. So, yeah, it is kind of humorous that both of those guys are, <laughs> are on the same team. Love Taylor is kind of a – uh, lifetime Achievement Award, if such a thing is possible uh, for a transfer that's only been in the, the league for two years. But I think that's more based off name and his performance last year uh, than what we saw this year because that's a interesting all-conference choice, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. So th- do you think Jones sticks around? He doesn't play, and when he, when he does play, he seems to get targeted like immediately – Not to be an ass, dude, but who's going to take that kid? I mean, I, I have I have Fair. had questions from the staff as to like, yeah, there's there's some other guys, and, and maybe this is directed to Jones, maybe it's not, but who, where, what, where's the entity that's going to come in and take this kid off your hands? It's I mean, also he's, his he's second transfer. Once. His so he doesn't have, look great. He'd have to be a grad transfer, right, in mm-hmm. order to be able to transfer again and be eligible. Is yeah. he graduated? I don't I don't think so. 
Yeah. Um, oh, we forgot to mention uh, DeKalen Brooks as well, who's still on the roster uh, technically, but I, he'll be coming off. I don't know if he's transferring or not. I, I just you know he, he walked on senior day. Mm-hmm. So and one of the one of the kids that caught my eye. Uh, it wouldn't shock me to see that kid find a position within the program somewhere um, as a absolutely as a non-player. So what about uh, what about Demari Tate? Injured both seasons. Fresh start there. You you still gambling on the talent? You know, f- former four or five star type kid. Tough decision to. for the staff. I mean, it's the highest process. It's the highest profile kid you've signed. Uh, obviously, we all hope that that changes in about ten days. Um, uh, <laughs> they're going to know better than I do, but uh, but I I think you give that kid another year and you keep trying to develop him and and try to see what's there. But you're right. We're two years into the process here. Maybe he needs a fresh start. Maybe you do. But uh, in my opinion, that's. If you flip a coin, it's more likely to show on the side that has him back on your roster than not, at least at this point. All right, so incoming here, really encouraging news. Travis Hunter and Sam McCall. I've uh, heard they're pretty good players. I did ask a source uh, about the whole uh, Billy Napier coached with the high school coach of Sam McCall, and I basically got told, uh, that's fine, and we have a lot of respect for Billy Napier but we've been recruiting Sam McCall for well over a year are very tight with him and his entire family and fully expect him to sign. He knows there's immediate playing time to be had in Tallahassee and, you know, secondary looked a lot better down the stretch. Maybe put some listeners at ease on that one. Um, You still have some high school kids you're involved with here. Kendrick Law, Earl Little Jr., a whole host of junior college guys. I think the fact that they're entertaining this many junior college guys, dude, tells me that they are interested in bringing in either a Juco or a Portal kid um, at the defensive back position. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also tells you that a lot of those names that we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation are, are probably going to be headed out of, the, out of the program. So uh, position to watch. There's about three or four of them here that are going to have a pretty significant amount of traffic. Uh, associated with them, and uh, the DB room will be right up there at the top. I got to say, though, like, uh, like, I'm very excited about this. Foreign punters were bringing in or anything like that, bud. You got the, the I, drop on it. I don't have any scoop on that. You, yeah. you know I don't really do the special teams thing at all. Um, what do you think about this kicker? <laughs> I don't know. Go, go, go to one of these kicking camps where, 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 where you, you pay you pay to get ranked. And you're like first on this guy's list and 101st on the on the other guy's list because he's got a different list of parents that pay him. Um, I don't know how to evaluate kickers. I'm not, not going to pretend like I do. That's kind of been my stance for you know quite a while. Uh, by the way, updated list here: uh, Domani Jackson. This is important. Five star corner out of California has cut his list to USC and Alabama. If you're scoring at home. You very much want him to go to Alabama if you want Earl Little to go to FSU. Bama says they have a spot for Earl Little. I believe them. I do think that there's some chance that Bama fills up, right? I don't know exactly what that looks like combination-wise, but I do know that Damani Jackson would be a piece of of that puzzle. So uh, if you're an FSU fan out there, you are rooting for Damani Jackson to not stay home at USC. You're rooting for him to go to Bama. That's one thing I wanted to cover uh, the other day when we were talking about the uh, Lincoln Riley to USC recruiting ramifications deal. Um, I don't think there's a lot of recruiting re- recruiting implications for this year's class of Kelly to LSU, by the way. I thought about it. I mean, Kendrick Law, we'll see. It depends on if they actually do keep Corey Raymond, potentially. At, uh, at LSU, but FSU's done a pretty good job recruiting Kendrick Law. Bama's also involved there. We'll see what happens on that. Transfer class, probably portal show. Unless probably seven to else. ten kids. Say again? Transfer class, probably seven to ten kids, dependent on uh, 
on how well you finish in the high school ranks. Like you're not going to take 10 transfers if, if you end up landing like Earl Little, Kendrick Law, Marvin, Nigel Lee Kelly, and, and Kevin Coleman. You just don't have room. And honestly, you'd be over the moon that you didn't have to take a big transfer because that, that sure. shows like you're really crushing high school. Yeah. Which is yeah, where you want to live. There'll be a direct correlation to how high you, you rank in your final classes. As we talked about on the previous podcast, you think they've got a outside of outside shot of hitting somewhere around five or six or something like that. And look, if you have all those dominoes fall for you, then yeah, you're going to go on the small side here. But yeah, I think your portal, your portal body fluctuates between six and 10 here, uh, depending on how well you do at the high school ranks. There's a couple of places where I'm all but certain you're going to go portal and other ones where, you know, if we said one or two, if things fall for you on the high school rank, that's probably more like zero to one. So this has been a good look. Uh, as we said at the beginning, just trying to have an honest conversation about where this roster is, what the coaches' thoughts are on it uh, at this point in time. I think we're going to get the vast majority of this right. Maybe one or two kids do uh, do something that we didn't think. Uh, but this will be a very interesting situation to watch play out, something that we've seen coming down the road for a while, and uh, now Florida State's going to have to try to make the room that's necessary to sign the class that we've talked about and still be able to bring in a couple of guys that they think can immediately contribute and set you up for a better year next year. And as we've talked about, frame you for, you know, your go get it year in, uh, in 2023. Um, I do, by the way, that, uh, I want to point this out. The Lincoln Riley contract, uh, tweet that was making the rounds yesterday from some guy I've never heard of. And, one way I ver- try to verify if somebody is like a person that I maybe I should be following, I check to see if like anybody else in the industry I work in is following this person, you know? And occasionally I find some good ones like, oh, wait a second. Like, I really trust these two reporters and they're like two of the guy's four followers. This is probably like a burner account for an AD or something like that. You know, I got a couple of those. This guy was not followed by anybody who I follow and Sportico track. Did you see the tweet, by the way? Is this buying both of his houses for 500k plus uh, six six years 110 million buying both houses for 500 thousand over ask <laughs> unlimited right. use of the private jet all all that stuff uh, Sportico tracked the guy down and he was like oh yeah none of this is verified it's just something that uh, that I heard uh, so but like some outlets ran with this. Mm-hmm. Um, including apparently Fox Sports, uh, SB Nation, my former employer, and Axios. But uh, this guy is an energy reporter, or excuse me, not reporter, an energy investor in Oklahoma. And uh, he declined a phone call from Sportico, and instead he said, in all candor, I'm annoyed that so people so people care about energy and so, and so many care about this sports tweet. After uh, He texted after declining a phone call. People will never know how hard I work in energy. Uh, however, when asked... How he got it, he said he received it from someone I do trust that is likely to have knowledge, and the information, quote, seems directionally correct. Mm, seems directionally correct, absolutely. I'm pretty impressed this guy got as far with this as he did. Like, like nobody said... It's impressive. That's Who impressive. is this? Dude? One of my ex-girlfriends, bud, is the, a leading expert in uh, natural gas, and she's a super bright lassie, and I respect her. Uh, I don't know that I would be, you know, regurgitating her talks on... Uh, UGA's pursuits of uh, their next head coach when that time comes or whatever else. It's uh, it's interesting what uh, people can latch on to at times like that and, uh, like you said, can kind of quickly become a uh, almost accepted piece of the narrative. Nonetheless, I'm sure that uh, the Riley family tree has done nothing but benefit of the uh, events over the last 48 hours, and uh, he will be compensated quite handsomely. Uh, I completely agree. He, he will most likely be be just fine there <laughs> at OU. Um, I think it's all I got for this episode. Hopefully, it'll be something you guys can can look back on, set the table. It, it also serves as a little bit of of a kind of a, a review of where they are after two recruiting classes. Not not un, not unexpected that it's not super rosy, but I think it does outline the nature of the rebuild that they're undertaking and why each situation is different until next time informative. Hope you all have enjoyed it. Uh, We'll have a couple other of these kind of 
uh, not off season episodes, but as we put a bow on the, this year, look to the transition into recruiting, start to build your roster out for spring. One of my favorite times. And uh, we will do our best to provide you uh, with the same level of coverage that we have for uh, 10 years or so now. So as always, thank you from myself, Bud, everybody else associated with the Nolcast. This has been uh, today's episode and we'll have something for you in the near future.